Well, good evening, everyone. I am going to just give everyone one more minute to get situated tonight. We've got another wonderful group of guests and a very inspiring topic tonight, talking about food systems change makers at Berkeley. We're going to talk to three of our esteemed alum about what they're doing in the food system and food business and how they got there and how they see the world now and 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 share their insights and experiences about how to make the world and the world of food a better place. I imagine it's been quite a week for everyone. Um, I am going to summon the spirit of Nikiko this evening and um, thoughtfully ask everyone, how are you doing tonight? Let's build a word cloud. Let's check, just check in and see if we can get the collective vibe spectrum of how the class is feeling. So there's a Menti link in the chat, if you wouldn't mind um, clicking on that and filling that in. And Eva will share her screen so that we can um, See how that builds. Can you do that, Eva? This is just very helpful to get a sense of where people are. Thank you for participating and thank you for being candid. We certainly appreciate that. Well, it looks like based on these responses, um, some, some care is called for. I'm glad to see that there's a little balance of excitement, but there seems to be a common theme of some tiredness and anxiety and hungry is okay. I know we're, we always meet during good uh, dinner time, but we're gonna try to make uh, tonight a bit of a breath of fresh air for you. Um, maybe we'll, uh just give this one more second and then eva i'm going to go back to mine my sharing and talk a little bit more about the week um you know chancellor chris shared uh in in light of the events of the week and the emotions that i think so many of us are are feeling and um perhaps even feeling um, overwhelmed by. I just wanted to share one paragraph from Chancellor Christ's letter this week, which really struck me as being very powerful and really relevant to what we're trying to do here at Edible Education. But this was from her letter that she sent out um, just two days ago. And this paragraph was called Changing the Course of Campus and Country. At times like this, our individual and institutional actions must demonstrate our commitment to justice and its equitable application on our campus and across our country. We are wholly committed to continuing our work to create an anti-racist university where everyone feels a true sense of belonging and a complete absence of bias and discrimination. We need and must settle for nothing less than a complete and comprehensive elimination of racism and anti-Blackness. There is great power and potential in our collective efforts and all that we embody, model, and embrace as a campus community all that we embody, model, and embrace as a campus community. And I'd like to think that we're doing um, our little part to live up to that um, intention and commitment through the work that we're doing together in edible education. And you'll recall last week, um, I'm gonna just share 
the to remind you we had three stunning founders last week with their fearless energy this was the word cloud you built um with the kind of mindset skill sets and characteristics that you observed from them um, but one of the core competencies of an entrepreneur or of a change maker is reflection and that's the ability to sort of sit with the overwhelm, sit with the fact that there's never enough time to do everything that needs to be done, to sit with the complexity, the chaos, the confusion, and settle down and reflect and come to a place of sort of distillation where you can think clearly about what needs to be done next. And you'll remember last week, Larissa, from Pod Foods reminded us, she said she realized one day that she could decide not to think about all the things that could go wrong and that she was afraid of and just focus on doing the next urgent thing that needed to get done with sort of hopefulness and clarity. So I'm hoping that um, you're practicing reflection at this time. I'm imagining your Plates are getting very full with deliverables and finals and other assignments and as we come rushing to the end of the semester. But I'll also just share in the spirit of Earth Day a little bit of um, gardener advice or gardener wisdom that I always think about that it's in times like this that are turbulent and unclear to um, Coming. be um, grounded, to try to be grounded. Sometimes I think about as it as being bamboo. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with a bamboo plant, but bamboo is deeply rooted, but it's also very flexible. So when the wind blows, when the storms come, and it's very turbulent and tumultuous and even dangerous outside, the bamboo moves with the storm, but it remains deeply rooted and grounded. So. I wish you grounding the next couple of weeks. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about your final um, assignments in the, uh, at the end of the class, but just a reminder that your papers are gonna be due in May and your team here, your teaching team is here to help you and support you and, and make sure you finish strong in Edible Ed. So if you need any help, you need to brainstorm, you need to focus, you need obstacles removed, we're here. You can send us emails, you can sign up for appointments. Our contact information is in the syllabus and on B courses. Um, our only request is that you get in touch with us before the end of April. Don't wait till the last minute. Hopefully you'll be gliding into your final draft and remember, this paper is something that you should feel inspired about. This is your own uh, path and journey as a food systems change maker. And you've done a lot of the groundwork and a lot of the cultivation throughout the semester by pulling together the different reflections and assignments that we've given you to prompt you for a strong finish on your paper. So um, let's see, Eva's gonna come back to that, I'm gonna stop sharing these slides. I'm getting ahead of myself. But now I'm gonna, it's my pleasure to introduce um, three really wonderful people, three inspiring people. Um, we have Minnie Fong from Imperfect Foods, Jose Alonso from Caldo and Rich Ventures, and Maria Olivier from Farmers Business Network. And they're each gonna tell you a little bit of their story, what they're doing now, how they got there, how they view the um, world of food that they're working in, how they think about making change in the world. And we invite your questions in the chat uh, throughout. We'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Remember, these people are just a few years ahead of you. They've all graduated from our um, institution at Berkeley. And um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Minnie Fong. Are you there, Minnie? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Perfect. Will. Let's put the spotlight on Minnie and let her get going. All right. Let me just share my screen. Good to see you again. 
Hi, everyone. All right. Can everyone see this presentation? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Will, Jordan, for inviting me to the class. It is so fun to come back to edible education. I remember very fondly, Will, um, sitting in on this class when I was still in business school. Um, and you know, I'm here to share, like what Will said, um, with everyone about the work that we're doing at Imperfect and the way we are we are reimagining grocery delivery for a kinder, less wasteful world. Um, but first, a fun introduction. This is me on my first day at Imperfect almost four years ago. You'll see how tiny our warehouse is. It and our office was the size probably of someone's living room. Um, at that time, we were a really tiny startup. I And our warehouse and our office was probably smaller than Anderson Auditorium, where you might have been sitting on a regular year. Um, and throughout my time at Imperfect, um, I have worn many different hats within the company. Um, take a, taking a quick step back, I graduated from Haas Business School, uh, class of 2013, I did the full-time program after that. I did a host of different things, um, worked on a food startup idea, and then worked on uh, worked in another startup uh, called Mimi Box, uh, which was focused on Korean cosmetics and um, just e-commerce. And then I joined Imperfect in 2017, and I've been there ever since. Um, it has been quite a wild ride. So when I joined Imperfect, I was actually initially hired to ha uh, head our expansion efforts. We were only in a tiny office in Emery Villa at that time. And um, my first project was actually to bring us to Portland. And since then, we have you know, my team and I have built out the playbook and kind of brought us to about 80% of the US population. So today Imperfect is a nationwide company. Um, about a year and change into that, I broadened my scope and started doing more business operations strategy type work. And part of that included thinking and rethinking about strategic initiatives like um, our sustainability framework and what it means to be a responsible player in the food system and how we might rethink our impact. Um, and then most recently, I transitioned roles to the merchandising team um, and transitioned to a role that's more focused on planning, on pricing and merchandising strategy as part of our efforts to grow as a full on grocer. Um, and I can speak to more about that transition in a bit. But first, a quick trip down memory lane for Imperfect. Um, Imperfect was started about five years ago by our co-founders, Ben and Ben. They were very passionate about fighting food waste and they actually started a nonprofit called Food Recovery Network across college campuses as they tried to address food waste on um, their campus. And they saw food wasted in the cafeterias, felt really passionate about diverting that waste to other people that would be able to use it instead of getting dumped. And you know, when they graduated, they thought to themselves like, where else could we have a larger impact? So they kept going up and up the food chain until they got to the farms where it all starts ultimately. And they realized that 20% of produce grown in America never makes it to the consumers. They're either tilled back into the land, they're composted, they're given away to or um, sold as fe animal feeds or byproducts like juicing or bars. And so they aren't allowed to kind of live up to its full potential just because they don't meet certain standards. Um, and that just blew my mind and blew their minds. Um, and so that's why they started Imperfect. Um, this one is, I think, a really big driving force for us. There's about 60 billion pounds of food that are wasted every year in the US. Billion, like that just, like, I can't even fathom what that number or weight looks like. Um, and then globally, the food system as a whole is responsible for about 20 to almost 40% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And according to Project Drawdown, um, food waste alone, actually, just food waste is responsible for about 8% of global emissions. 
Um, and a third of the food raised or prepared globally doesn't make it to the from the farm or the factory to the fork. And um, at Imperfect over the last five years, it, it, it feels like a drop in the bucket when you're faced with the number that's of 60 billion pounds. But we are very proud of the fact that we have been able to recover over 200 million pounds of food. So when we first started five years ago, our core product was the ugly produce box. You, if for some folks who um, are familiar with us in the early days, you might remember all our wonky looking produce with googly eyes, and it's very focused on fruit and vegetables. Um, but as we grew, we realized that there was waste happening across all other parts of the food chain as well, very similar to kind of the discovery process that the bands had. And, you know, there are things that, for example, um, a label is misprinted or, um, you know, I used to work in CPG at Unilever when we wanted to change the labels on a pa on packaging, we wanted to do it seamlessly across all the channels. And so we would pull out products that had old label packaging. And honestly, we wouldn't have any place to use it for. Um, and those things ultimately often end up getting wasted. There are silly reasons, big reasons, you know, uh, sometimes it's, expiration dates, which is a whole nother topic in and of itself, but um, grocery stores don't carry uh, products that are less than six months before it's dated uh, for best before, whether or not um, those are, you know, th there's another whole side note, sidebar I can go into about food, uh, about the waste generated by expiration dates, but that's a limiting factor as well for a lot of companies, a lot of grocery items. Um, so we started to expand our scope to include other grocery items that you'd see in a grocery store. So today, this is what a regular box would look like. Um, we have hundreds of items available on our website that span a wide range of grocery categories, produce, meat, seafood, meat alternatives, we carry impossible burgers. Um, we have shelf stable pantry items like olive oil or quinoa. Um, and all of them have a sustainability story behind it. So today, because we've grown and we've kind of rethought our mission and kind of our role within the food system, this is our mission today. We want to eliminate food waste, but also take that a step further and build a better food system for everyone. So we think about our, our, our role in the food system and sustainability as a whole in three fundamental ways, sourcing, energy and waste um, and sourcing is um, and I can I can talk about each vertical deeply but when we talk about energy and waste in particular um, it's not just the food waste but also the whole system we kind of in, engage in like whole system thinking and make sure that we think about waste in our warehouses waste in the consumers homes and end of life of what is the end of the life of the box that we deliver to you um, so first, sourcing intentionally. A large part of our strategy is building out direct relationships with growers and branded items or private label items that have a very powerful story. We actually, one of the things that my team is doing or is working on implementing is making sure we have a sustainability scorecard. So anything that goes through our doors and into the customer shelf or box, has to meet certain standards, whether it's um, it's a surplus story or the packaging changed, or um, you know the, the the manufacturer uses regenerative agriculture, um, upcycled products. There's a ton of different ways that we can be and support a better food system, um, and that's those are things that we definitely want to make sure we one encourage, but also use as a guardrail to bring products into our store. Another large part of our strategy is around private label products. So we partner with manufacturers who have byproducts that we can turn into delicious snacks. Um, and I'll share some samples um, in a the next few slides. So first one here is one of my favorite products. It's, you know, a pantry staple, whole almonds. Who doesn't like almonds as a snack unless you're allergic to them? So you don't like those. But um, the almonds that we carry are actually, if you look on the photo on the right, there's a lot of blemishes. Um, and those, and that's just 
natural. That's just a byproduct of nature and the reality that not all almonds and not all pieces of produce look perfect, um, even if we have been conditioned to do that um, because of our um, system and, and just going to groceries and seeing only number one product. So we actually buy this scarred, blemished almonds and repackage them and tell our customers, you know what, this is a great way to repurpose these almonds instead of making them into almond butter or something else where the farmer would not get the same bang for their buck. Um, it takes the same amount of energy, same amount of water to be able to, um, to grow almonds in any produce. But oftentimes these manufacturers, because of the blemishes, they don't get the same dollar for um, pound that they would otherwise get for perfect items. Here's a couple of fun items um, as well. So on the left side, pretzel pieces. So we have these chocolate covered pretzels, but you'll notice that there's a bunch of broken pieces there because we work with a manufacturer that makes these chocolate covered pretzels for a large grocery store. But as part of the natural um, production cycle, things inevitably get broken and typically that gets wasted and thrown away. And we said, you know what? Those are perfectly fine to eat. And those are delicious snacks. So we took that and repackaged it and said, and said to our customers, would you like chocolate covered pretzels? They might be a little broken, but they're just as delicious. And you know, it's one of our staple products that our customers really love. Um, the two other products here are, are upcycled products. So they use byproducts of other manufacturing. So the one on the right is uses oat flour as a byproduct of making oat milk. Another one uses coffee um, as in the um, coffee grounds in the production. This is a fun kind of snapshot of the wonky produce that would otherwise not make it to grocery stores. I um, especially love the eggplant with noses and you know this, the sweet potatoes that have legs, they, they, these don't get to the grocery store because they just don't fit the shelves. They can't stack properly. And we've built a system that doesn't really um, support for this kind of wonkiness. Um, I know I have only have three minutes left, so I'm gonna breeze through the next few slides, but using energy responsibly, we have a very unique model where we're not on demand. We're not like Amazon. We're not like Instacart. We are not um, gonna show up on your door two hours after you asked me to because you need the grocery immediately. Um, we, When you sign up, we tell you when your delivery window is, and that's primarily by design so that we can build density and have a low carbon um, kind of fleet. And then the second way we think about using energy responsibly is um, the energy that we use in our warehouses. We use a lot of refrigeration in our warehouses obviously for groceries, um, but that is, that's very energy intensive. So we work with our landlords to implement and use renewable energy. So actually I'm very proud to share that our LA facility is our first plant that is fully powered by solar right now. And that's you know in great partnership with our landlord. Um, the last way we think about sustainability and kind of rethinking um, the, the, the food system and just making an impact there is reducing waste that we send to landfill, not just on the food that we purchase um, and source appropriately, but also we think about the whole system, right? Like I said, we think about the box that gets to you. We make sure to purchase 100% recyclable, they're cycled um, cardboard. We make sure that the ink is compostable. So that when you put it in the compost, it actually doesn't uh, contribute to more issues. Um, and we have a take back program that I'm particularly excited and passionate about because ice packs and those, those foil liners are the bane of my existence as a, someone who gets these grocery boxes every week. I don't know what to do with them. And I'm so happy to say that we actually partner at least in San Francisco with another Berkeley company called Dispatch Goods. They take our ice packs, they sanitize it, and we're able to reuse it instead of throwing that into the waste stream. And that's something we're working to expand across all our markets. Um, and we experiment on returnable and reusable boxes that we can use instead of single-use cardboard. That's a little bit more ways to go, but those are things that we think about um, and that we want to make sure we consider as we think about our role in the food system. Um, so every year we've grown, gosh, so, so much exponentially over um, the last five years. And 
the more we grow, the more we're able to recover, the more we are able to contribute to folks who don't have access to good to food. We have a reduced cost program. So you, if you are low income, if you get, if you qualify for SNAP benefits, we make sure you are able to qualify for a low cost box as well. Um, so that in a nutshell is imperfect and what we do, and I have one second, according to my timer. Your timer runs really on time, Minnie. Awesome. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We really appreciate that. What a great overview. And I can't wait for the discussion because we've got some great questions from the students. And I've got a couple of questions too about that nonlinear path that the company kind of followed to get yeah. to where it is today to really invent its own future each step of the way. And it's so great that you've got this wonderful perspective going from the very early days to now being a, um, a, a significant company really covering a lot of different territories. So thank you. We'll have you back for our discussion a little bit later. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Jose Alonso. Jose is uh, someone I had the pleasure of um, learning from and uh, guiding a little bit in the Food Innovation Studio. Uh, he was also a former, uh, like, like Jordan and Pooja now, he was a former co-president of the Food at Haas Club. He's been a, just an upright leader and um, a real sense of encouragement for many students coming to Berkeley and also leaving Berkeley and, and getting into food. And Jose's got quite a, uh, an interesting story uh, coming from a family of restaurateurs and being told to stay away from it. And uh, here he is back in the thick of things with wearing multiple hats, uh, including a third hat that I don't think I've seen yet today. So without further ado, please welcome Jose. Hey guys, just gonna share my screen. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Will, for the uh, very, very kind intro. I, I love participating in anything um, that involves food and involves Berkeley. And um, graduated only two years ago, which is crazy to say at, at this point. Um, but excited to talk about what I'm working on, what we're working on. Um, so I'm Jose Alonso, co-founder and CEO of Calder Restaurant Technologies. Um, very succinctly, we, we develop hardware and software to help restaurants uh, run more effic uh, efficiently. Um, by background, Will men mentioned a little bit, um, I come from a family of restaurant operators. Uh, I grew up in restaurants. I saw how difficult it was to keep those businesses afloat. So my family did everything they could to keep me away from starting in the food industry. Uh, so I ended up starting in investment banking and six years later found myself back in a kitchen and went from investment banker to actual line cook. So I worked at um, four different restaurants um, uh, ranging from fast casual to fine dining. Um, and that's really where I started to understand how chaotic and how non-standardized food handling can be. Um, and combining how delicate the business side of things was with how crazy uh, a kitchen operation was, I thought that there was an opportunity to embed technology in, in and rethink how we run a restaurant operation. So from there, um, I came to Berkeley with the goal of learning uh, and building a team, especially a technical team, because you know I can't build anything myself. Um, I did spend some time and will mention that with a uh, food focused venture capital firm called Rich Products Ventures. Um, and really what I wanted to do was learn from leaders that were overlapping food and technology. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity for me to get a crash course on how to build a company. Um, and I'm super excited to talk about um, the food service industry and particularly Caldo and what we're trying to accomplish. So um, I think the first thing that I want to discuss is why now? Why is this relevant at this moment? 
why is incorporating technology in restaurant operations today more crucial than ever before in, in history? Um, so there's a, a couple of, of key reasons. Um, one is the introduction of off-premise, which is a fancy way of us talking about the takeout and delivery space. Um, it's grown immensely. The expectation of an eater has changed significantly. So now the way that we produce food has shifted. Um, we, there's the launch of cross-branded kitchens, sometimes called ghost kitchens, virtual brands, and even concepts um, that are called off-premise only, where you can't even sit in the restaurant. Um, operators now need to fulfill these new channels that didn't exist in the past. So there's an increased level of complexity that is actually pretty difficult and pretty expensive um, to, to handle if you're a traditional restaurant operator. This is not a, a surprise that the economics of a restaurant are very, very tough. So not only are the traditional costs increasing for a restaurant, but you start adding these channels and the technology that you need to operate that restaurant um, and the very, very thin margin continues to erode when you have to run a third party platform, mobile ordering, a POS system, KDS system, um, it becomes really, really difficult for these operators to make any sort of margin. The last point, which is relevant with the increasing costs are um, more forward looking. So not only is it difficult to find people to work in a lot of these quick service restaurants, the turnover rate is about 150% per year, but things are going to get really, really expensive. Um, the minimum wage is increasing um, and, and tipped wages are also going to be eliminated. So uh, a number of states in the United States are going to have to increase what today is about 30% of their cost structure by multiples. So what should these operators do to deal with that? And um, a majority of them are saying, okay, we need to look at technology as a solution to adjust our relationship with the amount of labor that we need. So the bigger question is, okay, why aren't restaurants prepared? Um, and the answer to that is there is a misalignment in terms of the size of the market and where people are investing their money and money invested leads to innovation. Um, the size of the takeaway market, which in includes uh, drive-through, walk-up, curbside is significantly larger than the delivery market, but investment has gone towards the front of house side of things. So POS tech and delivery tech. So the money and the innovation hasn't been focused on the back of house. And we believe that in order to run more efficiently, uh, especially when it comes to labor, you need to invest in the systems that operate in the back of house, which is how we arrived at our mission. Um, we are building hardware and software solutions that can retrofit any restaurant, um, any operator, whether it's a mom and pop or a chain, we don't wanna build our own brand. We, we are not good at that. We, um, we want to build tools to make the people that are experts in food operations run better. Um, and particularly, we want to be able to equip restaurants and food service workers to deal with these increased costs for labor and, and off-premise. So we have a, a master plan and are working on a number of products right now, and they range from hardware to software to new business models. But the one that we're focused on right now and the one that's, that's um, closest to market right now is our hardware product. Uh, and it's tackling what we believe to be the toughest efficiency problem out there and it has to do with labor. So we, we like to call our, our system Octo, um, like a small octopus uh, operating inside of a box. But our, our system is um, a logistics solution. Um, it operates similarly to a make line or an assembly line in a restaurant. So if you think about a Chipotle, whenever the orders come into the line, um, everything that happens on that line is automated. Um, so orders come in either digitally or, or physically, 
And we are building systems that can manage ingredients, can collect information, uh, and can build your meal autonomously. So we handle 28 ingredients, we build meals in 45 seconds, and we're doing it in a way where restaurants don't need to purchase a piece of equipment. And that's something that is an issue for, for, for operators. Um, they don't have the capital to um, make that upfront investment. So we do it as a, as a, as a service. Um, and I don't want to get in too much details about what we're building, so we can skim through it, but I want to try and highlight what problems we're solving for food service operators. So you're limited with space. Uh, we only take up about 20 square feet uh, in our unit, and kitchens are a nightmare to build in. So we don't have to construct. We don't have to build a water connection. Um, we just connect to the wall, and you're ready to go. Um, we've always been very focused, especially me coming from the, the food service um, um, industry on food first. So really accurate, precise portioning. We're making food safer by reducing touch points, um, sealing ingredients and giving alerts to the operators to know, hey, you need to clean this uh, ingredient or refill an ingredient because it's dangerous to not do so. Um, and in terms of presentation, we are the experience of us as eaters um, has to do a lot with our eyes. So we've built a system that's very dexterous in terms of how do you build a meal exactly the way that the restaurant operator would. Um, so we build meals um, like a 3D printer almost. And this is an example of, of one bowl that we built 12 times in a row and it was exactly the same every time. Not going to go into too much on, on this, but what we're trying to do is give a, an edge to restaurants. How do we capture information by using this system as an IoT device to know exactly what happens? Where do you waste food? Where are you making mistakes from an ingredient perspective? Um, how do you make sure that you're operating in a way that's safe? Um, our quality assurance system uh, in, our, in our computer vision inside of the system um, helps to do that and helps the machine learn as they continue to build meals. And then our RFID system that um, identifies any ingredient that's input into the station. So it's not a job for the operator, but it makes their lives much, much easier. And then lastly, um, we have our kind of um, proprietary piece of, of tech, which are our modules. So we design our own modules, build them out and are able to um, adjust them depending on the food. So this is the, the one piece that I didn't want to go into too much detail, but this is kind of our secret sauce of, of how we do things. So if we're doing uh, burgers or we're doing tacos or we're doing bowls or salads, the machine itself changes because those modules uh, change. And I, I want to be cognizant of time, but I don't, am I, am I, am I too long right now? Too much time, Will? So yeah, You're I good. You're good. You have, okay, five, you have six minutes left. <laughs> okay, great, great. I got nervous because I'm on full screen. Sorry, guys. Um, and then the big question is, how do we help restaurants? We're working uh, with a total of eight or nine pilot customers right now, um, and they all use us uh, in a different way. Um, so the first one and the most obvious one is we reduce labor costs, we increase food safety, we reduce food, food waste. So we're replacing parts of the kitchen uh, with an automated system that you can plug and play. Um, the second way that we found is through revenue growth. So if you have a restaurant that currently does pizza and only pizza, this is a way to extend that menu. So you wanna get into salads, you wanna get into pasta, but you don't want to train a full team. You don't wanna change the logistics of your restaurant. You grab a system and put it into your in your footprint, and it makes things much easier to grow from a revenue perspective. Point number three is kind of similar, where you even want to run a completely separate brand, a virtual brand, from the inside of your four walls, um, and that's something that's become very very prevalent in the space to actually grow the top line um, sales for the same four walls. Uh, and then the fourth point is working with uh, corporate campuses hospitals, airports, um, where we're building a solution that's a little bit um, more capital uh, efficient. Uh, you don't need as many people, you don't need to build out a full location, and you can actually service people on an off-premise basis closer to when the actual eaters need it. 
Here's an example, uh, just very quickly on um, one restaurant that we're working with, where uh, we help them with their mise en place um, to start. Then uh, we take off certain pieces of their operation, in this case, their salad line, um, and fully automate it. But on the other, which, which ends up leading to about 100 to $200,000 in savings for them at a large scale uh, per location. Now, when you think about um, the super exciting side of things if, if, that I'm excited for are how do, you, how do we extend your menu? How do we use this as a creative tool to extend your offering? So this company uh, has one or two salads and they were considering getting rid of them because they were problematic. They were making mistakes with them, um, even though they were some of the best margin items. So this is a solution for them to suddenly add five, six, seven salads to their to their operation um, without having to spend a lot of time and retrain people. Jose, and then, just a quick definition for those that don't know: what is mise en place? <laughs> so mise en place is everything that's done at the beginning of service. So if you think about um, cutting vegetables portioning ingredients, uh, prepping ingredients, peeling ingredients. Um, that's, that's really what I was referring to. In this case, this restaurant likes to portion out because they do so many orders a day, they do hundreds of orders a day, they like to portion out certain things in advance. And they have a team of five or six people that do that in the first three hours of every day. So if you think about that from six people times $20 an hour for, for three hours every day, 365 days um, a year, a significant um, uh, cost piece to how you run the restaurant. And then I, I don't, I don't want to talk too much more about this. I mean, I was hoping to just give an, 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 an idea of how, um, how much innovation there's, there, there, there's an opportunity for in the restaurant and the food service space. So these are some of the um, sectors in the restaurants that we are talking to and, and working with. Um, where they are, they've become, and, and that's partially because of COVID, very open to innovation and changing the way that they run their restaurants and they have been running their restaurants for decades. Um, so it's a super, super exciting time um, to be in the food tech space. Um, it's taken me and Will knows this a really, really long time, uh, especially building a hardware product or a robotics product but there is a significant amount of innovation coming down the pipeline, whether it's on the off-premise side, the ghost kitchen side, automation. So I, 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 I just enjoyed answering, answering questions from you guys or, or happy to talk more. If you let me, I'm gonna end up talking for two Thank hours. Thank you, Jose. This, what, a, <laughs> what a great start and so wonderful to see how far you've come with the whole imagining of what Caldo can be and all of the places that can intervene in the system to, um, to really make it better for restaurant operators. So thank you. We are going to take a quick break, just 10 minutes. Please stretch, breathe, eat, nourish yourselves. We'll be back with Maria at three minutes after seven. So see you then, 10 minutes. All right, welcome back everyone. Love to see your faces and our speakers love to see your faces too. So if you don't mind, if you're able, turn your camera on just to make a little contact. And if Paulina is still pouring chocolate covered pretzels directly into her mouth, we can see that too, no. Um, well, we've got another wonderful, uh, guest alum who did her undergraduate at Berkeley and her graduate degree at the other business school down the peninsula. Well, you're wearing the wrong colors tonight, Maria. Oh, oh. wait, that was not oh. intended. Oh. <laughs> Didn't get the memo, no. I did not get the memo. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Olide, who is the CFO, Chief Financial Officer of the FBN, the Farmers Business Network which is really one of the breakout innovations in the world of food and agricultural systems. Who would have thought that there would be a data and analytics platform that has scaled uh, 
in the ways it has um, in the last years. And I'm imagining Maria's job is uh, very robust in that um, Farmers Business Network is one of the uh, uh, recipients of ample venture capital investment. And along with venture capital investment comes great expectations. So welcome, Maria. We can't wait to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, unlike uh, many and Jose, graduated from Haas a very long time ago. Uh, so I have had a, a very long and happy career. Uh, but uh, I, I did actually want to spend five minutes on my career trajectory because I was asked to share a little bit about uh, the evolution and uh, the choices I have made uh, along the way and uh, to, to the point that we're, where I am today. So I thought that I would spend uh, five minutes on that and then talk about 15 minutes about uh, the FBN story. Uh, so as, uh, you know, as William said, we, I, I did my undergrad at uh, Haas and uh, graduated and started uh, in finance. So I've been most of my career, although not on my career in finance, and uh, went and worked for KPMG, uh, one of the big four accounting firms in San Francisco and the audit side. Uh, love my job. I think one of the themes of my career is that uh, I, one of the requirements is that I love my work. I have to love what I do. I've loved everything that I do. And when I stop loving what I do, then I know it's time for a change. So the second part of my career is have courage to change when it's time to change. Uh, and so that's really what I've lived by. Uh, changing is not always easy. Uh, but it's uh, worked out uh, very well for me. So I was there for uh, about five years, uh, my manager, loved everything that I did. It was a, a you know, new thing for, for me to do, wait to, uh, wait to get to know the industry, different companies. Uh, but after five years in audit, uh, you know, as a manager, uh, I, it felt very repetitive. It seems like I was doing the same thing over again. I didn't, you know, it wasn't part of a company. Um, and I sat down one day to review, for those of you guys that don't, we, we managers review audit areas to review the cash area. Uh, and there was very, one day very specifically when I sat down and I thought, if I have to review the cash area one more time, I'm going to throw up, right? So I was like, that's it. <laughs> I'm done. This is as much as I uh, will uh, will will uh, have provided to, to KPMG and it's, it's time to move. So at that point, I, I decided to do a career switch. So I decided to go to the, uh, to the school down in the peninsula to get uh, an MBA, um, which was you know, a, great, uh, a great move for me. Um, and then after that, uh, I, I did strategy consulting. So I moved to Europe um, actually. So I moved to London for a year. Um, joined a strategy consulting firm it was the 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 tech boom uh, of the time, and so lots of technology, lots of startups, uh, exciting stuff. And uh, spent uh, one year uh, in London, and then moved to Milan, Italy, and did uh, consulting there for about four years in Italy. Um, had um, my two daughters while I was there, so I had uh, started a family, got married, started family, had two daughters in uh, in Italy. Um, and having, you know, being a mother and also being wed to also a strategy consultant, uh, it was very difficult to have kids and have two strategy consultants uh, in the mix, right? So we decided, okay, I'm going to do a, a little bit something different. So for a couple of years, I started a chain of childcare centers in Italy while I was uh, kind of having been pregnant and having kids. And so uh, that system was very underdeveloped in Italy and thought that I could uh, you know, start something new and fresh there. So I did that for a couple of years, then decided it was to, time to come back, um, decided to rejoin KPMG, but in the management consulting uh, practice uh, at that time, uh, was there for another four or five years, made partner in the management consulting practice. And uh, again, arguably could have stayed there as partner, being partner of big four consulting firm is a perfectly good way to, to have a career. Uh, but then, you know, I said, well, look, I, I've been doing this for a while as well. And I was happy. Then I got a call from ADP, 
uh, the uh, payroll company in the East Coast and they wanted to recruit somebody that could they could groom to be the corporate CFO. And I thought, well, that's something interesting. I'd love to be a public company CFO one day. And so uh, picked up my family, moved to the East Coast uh, and did that for four years. Phenomenal experience. Loved it. Loved working for the company. It's actually a great company. Um, uh, but it, uh, I think after four years, I found it was a very stable company, which is there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but as at KPMG, my clients, you know, my clients were Google and Facebook in their early years. We had, you know, Intuit, we had all degrees to startups. And so really decided that I, I missed the Silicon Valley technology startup scene, um, all respect to, to ADP, a great company. Um, but decided, you know what, this is really what I want to do. I want to go back to Silicon Valley and do a startup technology company, uh, was the CFO of a human resource technology company for a year. Um, and then I got a call from FBN. Um, so that's really four and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, was very interesting because at that time, four and a half years ago, uh, many of you guys know, ag tech was not even a thing back then, right? It was not non, a non-word. I mean, I, I, somebody told me ag tech and I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing about it is that uh, a couple of things, so that definitely the, the mission uh, of FBN is to help farmers prosper, right? That's really kind of what the mission of it is. Um, and so a couple of things. One, I talked to the team there and it became very obvious that there had been very little disruption in the agricultural industry. Uh, and what an opportunity. It was actually shocking. I mean, I had never really thought about it, frankly, but it was shocking to really just realize that there was still an industry that had seen so little disruption, technology disruption. Um, the team was phenomenal uh, and uh, decided to, to join. Um, and there's another part of my background that I think will be relevant as well. Um, I was born on a farm in Mexico. Uh, it was in a small village. It was a sustenance farm. So definitely knew what it meant to farm and be in a farming uh, community and a farming family. Um, and how hard of a, of a job it is and how and what work it was and the fact that it actually takes a lot of skills you have to be a scientist to some degree you have to be a business person uh, it, it's actually not uh, you know as easy as it sounds it's very hard work uh, so had the roots and, uh, and my parents uh, immigrated to the U.S. as immigrant farm workers and so uh, grew up in Central Valley of California also myself working uh, as a farm worker, as a kid, you know, I would go pick berries and grapes. And so I, I would follow my parents around and kind of uh, did what they did. So definitely, uh, again, was understood uh, farming and agriculture and, you know, how, how things uh, were and had uh, connected to the mission. So I thought that this is definitely a company, definitely a mission that I would be very happy to dedicate uh, a good portion of my career too. Um, and so that's, you know, four and a half years ago, uh, it was, the company was uh, post series B, uh, but pre-revenue. Um, now we're on a trajectory to be over, uh, I probably shouldn't talk about the revenue since we're still private, but to, uh, in the hundreds of millions, I would say of revenue um, already in, in four and a half years. Uh, raised over $500 million, as William said, from some of the best technology companies, uh, Google Ventures to uh, Double Bottom Line, DBL, uh, from uh, Kleiner Perkins, and, and recently from a lot of the crossover funds, BlackRock, uh, T. Rowe Price, uh, Fidelity. So definitely have uh, been able to attract uh, a, a great amount of investment uh, to the firm, uh, when I joined, I think the company had about uh, 60 people and about uh, were uh, over 600 employees uh, today. So definitely have uh, grown to be a very large platform for farmers. So I know it took a, a lot more than five minutes in that introduction. So I'm going to have to speed through the rest of the uh, presentation here. So I will now present um, my screen and talk uh, a little bit about FBN in the last uh, 11 minutes here. So uh, let me see. 
Uh, again, the mission of FBN is really a social impact mission. Uh, it is to power the prosperity of the family farmers around the world. And many people call big farms corporate farms, and there are corporate farms. But mainly, many of the farms in the Midwest, even though they're large, are really still operated by family farms. I mean, they, they, there's a lot of advancement in the, the past that has happened around uh, tractor usage, right? So there's a lot of, uh, of the, the, the mechanical revolution that happened in the turn of the century that allowed farms uh, to grow, but still family farms. Um, so that's really kind of our mission is to really center around allowing farmers to, to maintain their farms and, 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 and have them um, stay in the family because it's harder and harder. Um, and so the, the issue is that uh, farmers really are squeezed in the middle. They're still small businesses, but they're flanked on either side of very large, very global uh, multinational companies that uh, really squeeze the profits out of the uh, out of the farmers, right? So uh, up to now, you, you have these enormous uh, companies um, that really extracted most of the value and the profits from the farms, so really leaving the absolute minimum amount of of, of uh, margin to for the farms to to survive. Uh, and so that's really kind of, uh, and again, the crop prices are down, uh, corn production is, 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 uh, you know, is up. And so they, they really, the farmers are under uh, distress here. And so farmers uh, business network is really leveling the playing field by, by bringing together and creating a network of farmers and their data. This is very important. It really levels the playing field because now they actually have the information that they need to level the playing field. So just a couple of examples about how our platform adds value to farmers. So price trans pricing is very obfuscated in this industry, uh, meaning that there are no list prices. So every farmer every input you know, that they buy seed, uh, crop protection, et cetera, that they actually buy, um, there is no list price. If they go to a local retailer, it's literally a one-to-one -one negotiation with the retailers. And they never know what actually that is that they pay, uh, they're paying. Um, the, the, the quality of the products is obfuscated. So there's, very, there's a very large amount of information um, asymmetries. Uh, and so what what uh, our platform does is kind of bring all that information together. So the farmers contribute all their price data, all their agronomic data, and all of a sudden scientifically, they actually uh, know categorically what products work better on their farms because we've collected all the data from all the farmers um, and actually can scientifically prove which of the seeds and which of the chemicals will work best in their farms uh, or which other products. Uh, and price transparency is the same. They'll give us you know, their price and then for the first time ever, they'll see what prices other, other farmers are paying in their region. Um, and so when we actually came out with this price transparency, which was very simple, by, by the way, technology, it was one of the simpler solutions we brought. We literally rattled the industry uh, because now the farmers were going in printing out more or less what people would buy. They would either buy from us because we actually started retailing as well, um, or go to the retailer and says, you know, you've been, uh, you've been overcharging me uh, for 30 years and, you know, here's the proof. Now let me negotiate a better price. So that was transformational for the industry. Uh, and so that's really kind of how we, we got started um, we today have uh, about 26,000 farming members in, in three countries, uh, which is around only about 3.3% penetration on members, but on the acres, because we do tend to uh, have larger acres, we're about uh, four, so we have about, we're on 65 million acres, which is about 14% of the crop acres in uh, North America and Australia. So definitely uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, information to share back with, with the growers. Um, but we didn't stop there. Really, the, the vision of our CEO, uh, Amal Deshpande, was that he really wanted to create a commerce platform for farmers, right? So there's an element of data and network and transparency that we bring to the growers, but we're, we're also a commerce platform. So we sell seed and crop protection and it actually 
now we actually have our own sheet. We literally own germplasm and, and, and compete against the Monsantos and, and Cortivas of the world. And we use data and we use a network of farmers to innovate in a way that uh, you know company on its own cannot innovate. Um, the same thing with crop protection products. I can go into lots of detail as to why our offerings are much more transparent and about to, you know, 10 or 15% less expensive than what, uh, what the uh, other players uh, have. And we have, we don't have a bricks and mortars. We basically order online through the foreign, or we actually have a field sales team, um, but all of our products are delivered to the farm. So we actually have a very we do own our own inventory, so we have a very complex system of warehouses across North America and Australia, um, and we deliver straight to the farm. So we definitely are a, a commerce platform, but we're also a fintech platform. We have financial services. We actually have a lending platform where we bring together financial services with our farmers um, in a much more fintech way than it is, much quicker, ease of use. Uh, you know, lower rates, et cetera. And we also offer um, health insurance, um, uh, health insurance and crop insurance products as well. So again, uh, the, the point of our differentiation um, is that we also do everything that's differentiated by data and technology. If you think even about the, the lending, uh, we have so much, we have practically everything that we need. Uh, and so we, we do have uh, the the data and we can practically make the decisions um, the decisions here just I'm sorry just, I think I'm getting a, a chat but I'm five minute warning uh, so the decisions uh, uh, very quickly because we we are uh, the data and technology is uh, it, it underlies everything that we do as well as our own scientific IP so we have lots of moats around uh, our business. But we also have a very strong sustainability uh, component to our business um, from all aspects. We, we have from our data, uh, a lot of, of data that really helps the farmers make sustainable decisions. Um, and this was, you know, again, uh, five years ago before all of this started to be uh, cool, right, and, and trendy. Uh, but, you know, again, we, we can actually categorically say that your yield is going to be higher if you do no-till. It's a practice that it's known. We, we have the scientific data to prove it. We can prove it to our growers. Uh, we can actually prove that you can actually overseeding, over applying nitrogen is actually bad. There is a, so we can actually help the farmers make optimal decisions of how much seed and how much nitrogen they can apply. So that's a part of our solution. Um, plus, we actually have, uh, we work with companies like Unilever and Tyson and Poet uh, that will pay for sustainable practices to our farmers. Uh, so we actually are the certification engine between those companies that certify the, the practices of the farmers uh, and then allows companies like these to pay a premium to our growers. Uh, we have an organic platform. Uh, and as well as we just launched our gradable carbon markets, right? So we, we definitely are one of the, say, three, four carbon markets that have been announced recently. Um, and, you know, the Biden uh, administration has announced big plans for that. So we're going to play in, in that as well. So a big, big sustainability component to what we do. Um, and so that's actually really uh, all I had. Uh, I think, I guess I, I, I finished on time. Um, you I did. It was, it was really wonderful. I loved your personal story and I love where you've ended up on this journey. You, you've, you've found your place and your calling. Um, it's, it's almost like coming home to, uh, to your, your true work. So what, a, what an inspiration. So um, thank you, Maria. And, we are going to, um, one of the things that we've done in the class uh, this semester is uh, maybe we'll have you stop sharing your screen now, Maria. Yes. And we'll go back. What we're going to do is um, we, we've uh, created something we call Homeroom here at Edible Ed Online uh, and give our students a chance to um, reconnect with their um, colleagues each week and kind of continue a conversation. Uh, you'll notice in each of these conversations that people had to make decisions 
uh, make changes like Maria was talking about. You know, I went from this and then I went to that and I saw this opportunity. Um, Jose talked about, um, well, Jose talked about coming from the restaurant industry, going away from the restaurant industry, coming back into the restaurant industry. Minnie talked about, I went to a startup, I went to Unilever, which is the second largest food company in the world. And then I've come back to a startup. So this journey, this is a learning journey. It's a professional journey. I'm sure many of you are thinking about what am I gonna do next? How do I take the next step? And change makers always think about what am I gonna do next? And how am I going to sort of de-risk that step so that I can take another risk? So I'd love it if um, Eva could put up another Menti word cloud for you in chat. And what I would like to do is co collect the intelligence of the classroom of our Zoom auditorium here about what are you thinking about doing next? Or is there a class that you wanna take? Uh, is there an internship you wanna get? Is there a book you wanna read? Is there a field trip that you wanna take? Um, what do you want to do next to enliven and grow your capabilities to um, understand what's next for you? So please share now in the in the mentee, and this will be a great way. We'll we'll um, once everybody contributes to this, we will um, both share it, so you might find um, similar thinking people, and then. Um, I will do my best to also help our teaching team develop resources. I see a lot of you want to visit a farm or work on a farm. Um, we can help you with that. We know a lot of people that need help on farms. As a matter of fact, I was meeting with a farmer today online. She is in Maryland and, and serves the Chesapeake Bay area. And she was telling me that just in the midst of spring, she now has to batten down all the hatches um, for a snowstorm and winds that are coming. So it was a reminder, like Maria told us how hard farming is, but it's a great experience. It is humbling. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing these. Um, what we're gonna do now, um, please do this. And while you're doing that, we're gonna multitask here. I'm actually gonna put you all into your homerooms for seven minutes. And what we'd love for you to do is share in your homeroom uh, a little bit about what you are envisioning. Just don't be shy, just share kind of like, what are you thinking about? How has this class sort of um, helped you think about your strategic vision? And I think one of the other attributes of change makers and entrepreneurs is that they learn how to ask for help. They learn how to enroll other people in their vision. Um, so maybe you can do that with your, your peers. You can talk to them a little bit about what it is you'd like to do. Just dream, it doesn't have to be grounded into any reality right now. And um, for the rest of you, be an active listener and ask some clarifying questions and let's spend seven minutes in homeroom working on this prompt. Where could you use help to achieve your strategic vision? Where can you offer help to others? So the power of reciprocity. We, we will see you back in seven minutes for a wonderful panel discussion with our special guests. All right, welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoyed your homeroom break. Um, we've got this wonderful board of lots of suggestions, and I'm going to ask Eva to find a way to share it, maybe in an announcement or on B courses, so that it might spark your own um, thinking for what to do next. Because we've got so many great suggestions. Oh, I see you can scroll through it. There's 90, 90 of you contributed to this. So, oh, visit Masamoto Farms. Yeah, that is a great one. I put that on everyone's list. So what we'd love to do now is spend a little time with our um, guests. So if you want to stop sharing and maybe spotlight
Minnie and Maria and Jose and me, and we can kind of hang out in a chat like we're in those comfy chairs in Anderson Auditorium that you remember. Um, let's see if we can get all four of us together. That would be great. I We have some great questions from the class, which I'm going to try to find and refer to here in a minute. But I wanted to start with the idea of collaboration and teams. One of the entrepreneurial skill sets that we talk about is this idea of, you know, enrolling someone else in your mission. And, um, you know, I think back many to when Ben came to our class in the very early days and presented like the first deck for imperfect foods. And Maria, I actually worked with Amol when he was at Cargill Ventures <laughs> and remember him, you know, getting a deep, you know, I mean, Cargill is one of the largest, um, you know, agricultural companies in the world, if not the largest private company. But the, um, you know, the way he got sort of deep exposure and same with Jose, you all, you know, sort of had a purview into like the deep pain points of, um, of a sector. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit, maybe we'll start with Jose, because Jose, I remember your epiphany in Food Innovation Studio when you sort of had this idea, but something was missing. Maybe tell a little bit about of that, of, of that story. Do you remember what I'm talking uh, about? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, this concept started as a vending machine. Um, and I know I, I introduced that to Will and he kind of supported me, but he was like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but the, the biggest, um, the biggest struggle is understanding whether people need this. Um, well, there's, there's two big struggles. One is not being a technical person and inspiring or motivating somebody to take their skills away from something else and, and commit their time to what your passion project is. And at this point, we have a team of seven people of phenomenally intelligent engineers. Uh, I'm by far the dumbest person on our team. And it's, um, it's been the hardest part to communicate a sense of passion and understanding for what you're trying to build. Um, and one thing that will push mm -hmm. me to do um, in Food Innovation Studio was go out and ask people, do you actually need this? Um, and there's been an evolution of what those answers look like, and that's passed on to what the product is. And it's super scary, um, but you have to be vulnerable and, and willing to bump your head uh, against the wall. But I remember also pushing you to get out of the business school and walk across to the engineering quad, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's, I mean, it was necessary. And, it, and I guess, yeah, that, I, I think that was the point that I was looking for is this complementary skill and, and to have the courage, the conviction, the passion, the vision to actually get somebody's attention pulled off what they were thinking that they were going to do to join your parade. Yeah. And then it, it, it was um, scary. But at this point, it's something that I love doing. I love working with technical people uh, and people that have abilities that I could never imagine. I, I mean, I'd love to learn how to program and, and build robotics, but I, I, I don't think I will. But um, yeah, you have to be comfortable getting outside of your, your area of expertise. And Minnie, you joined at such an early stage of Imperfect and you've seen so many, I guess what we would call pivots or turns or twists and how have you seen the team like what what gave you the confidence to jump you know you'd been been in a really big company you'd been in a startup what what was it that made you want to join that team and and commit yourself to it yeah well i was a customer actually of imperfect so I distinctly remember the moment I got my confirmation email at the bottom, it said we're hiring and I clicked it and they had a job description of, a, of the role that I was actually doing at the startup I was with before that. Um, and just kind of to a little off tangent, but jump off on your earlier point about career and the changes. I 
right after business school, I focused on my own food startup, um, decided to walk away from it, worked for a Korean cosmetics e-commerce company that has nothing to do with food. Um, But what I will say is that I would hands down have never gotten this job at Imperfect if I didn't have that experience. Uh, Because a lot of my experience there was ramping up a team from 10 people to 100 people, opening a new warehouse, like that kind of like ground floor experience was not something I could speak to if I didn't go sell cosmetics for a, a couple of years. Um, so that was just a quick aside about the career oh, great piece. insight though, great insight that sometimes mm-hmm. your path is, is circuitous and getting that experience, one thing leads to another. Yeah. And for me though, to, to join Imperfect really, it's because, you know, it's funny because I was always passionate about food, but I come from the angle when, when, when people always say, when people say I'm interested in the food space, there's a very wide spectrum. You can go from the farming piece, like Maria is doing, the robotics and restaurant piece that Jose is doing. And then I'm in the grocery space and it's such a wide spectrum. Um, For me, I never actually was, I wasn't like the food waste warrior. I was not the, I was not the person that was like going to compost everything. I mean, I do compost, but like, I think my, my knowledge about food waste and, and that sustainability angle was not, the primary reason I joined Imperfect. I joined Imperfect because it was a fascinating model. It was in the food space. It was consumer facing. That was the honest truth. Uh, I enjoyed meeting the team. And throughout my time here, I've really grown in my own personal journey around sustainability and understanding the role that we play in the food system. Mm, Wonderful. And Maria, you talked about these, you know, making these changes, This, this, you get to this point where you know that you just can't do that same thing again. I know there's a lot of people watching tonight who are in the same place thinking like, wow, I've learned a lot from this place. I've really been challenged, but I think there's a next for me. So what advice do you have for people that are in that? And because they're busy with their job, like you were busy with kids and I mean, family and how do you, how does one sort of find the, the time and the space to be intentional about making that change while you're doing your regular life. What what hints do you have for us? Yeah, I mean, I I think like it's one of the best things I've done in my life. And one of the biggest advices that I have is, you know, don't be too busy to make a change. Uh, I think that change is hard. You get too busy. Uh, and you get to a point where you're in a good position, right? I was a partner at KPMG. Some people thought I was crazy for wanting to leave that position. Uh, but again, I got to the point where I thought I, I, would, I could provide more value elsewhere. Um, and I made the change. I was at ADP, uh, a senior executive, making a lot of money, uh, frankly, and on the, my way to be the corporate CFO. Uh, some people thought I was crazy for thinking about a change then. And I had to move my family across the country. Uh, to do that again. Uh, and like I said, I, I think that uh, I've always you know, followed my heart. I really want to, uh, I think that I'm at my best at any company if this is really what I want to do. And mm-hmm. if I ever get to a point where I'm doubting that this is not for me, that I'm getting a little stale, that my passion is waning, um, then honestly, it's, it's time for me to go. Uh, and because I think I will add more value elsewhere and you just have to do it. When I left ADP, I literally left without having a job, um, which is scary as heck, as you can imagine, right? It's very, very scary, but I told them I was leaving. They're fabulous actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I landed, uh, uh, at a startup that frankly wasn't the greatest. So yeah, that was, you know, I knew two weeks in that that was not the place I wanted to be, but, you know, it was uh, kind of already listed on the Australian stock exchange and the board convinced me to stay there for a year. Uh, but that was a little bit of a move that, uh, you know, but, you know, again, to Minnie's point, if I hadn't had that role as the CFO at a startup for a year, I probably wouldn't have gotten approached by FBN or it wasn't, it wouldn't have been such a you know, compelling uh, uh, resume. So I, I, I just say, you know, have, have the courage to just take the time and, and make a change. So don't get too busy that you can't concentrate on the change. Have the courage of your convictions that you know when it's time to go and go for it. So, right. um, you know, this class would not have been possible without Jordan Bennett's um, facile 
coordination and cure, co curation. And I just want to thank Jordan, one of our teaching team members, and also just give Jordan a chance. Maybe, Jordan, do you want to facilitate some of these questions from the students for our guests? Is that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, great. Come join us. <laughs> Jump into the spotlight. There she is. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for being here. Um, we did have a question come in through the discussion board from Michelle, and it's it reads, it often feels like there are so many things we need to fix within the food system. How can we take the first step as students and leaders to solve the problems within the food system? What Anyone wants steps? to jump in? <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. The agricultural and food system is vast, right? It is so big. It is one of the largest industries in the world. Uh, and it's different in every country. I mean, so, so the food and, and agriculture and food systems is very different. You know, it's very different. The way you produce food in the U.S. is different than the way you produce food in India or Mexico or, or Africa. Uh, and there's so many ways, I think, that you can be a change maker uh, in the agricultural and food. And you've heard of three ways uh, here today, but there are some sure hundreds more. Um, and I think it's probably impossible to, to, uh, to figure out a way to change all of the system. Uh, but there's always a part of the system, I think, that you can find a way to, to change. And uh, I, I think that there's a lot of brilliant ideas and uh, of ways to, think, uh, to do things. And I think that, uh, you know, if you choose a place and, and uh, to start and, and grow, I think that there's, you know, many ways you could do it. Yeah, I think to echo what Maria just shared, you know, it, it, it's the, it can be, it can often feel almost debilitating when you are presented with all the issues that are in the food system. And, and, and I feel similarly when I talk about or think about climate change, like other than feeling like the world is ending, you know, and what can I do? And I'm just this one little person. Um, I, I think the food system um, and how broken it is can often feel that way too. And I think similar to what Maria said, like there is a wide spectrum of things that you can do. And there's a wide spectrum of what it means to make an impact in the food system. Um, and, you know, myself, Jose, Maria, we all have different parts that we're passionate about and that we're excited about. And I think for me, it's starting with understanding the intersection of what you're good at what you're ex and what you're excited about. Um, I'm very excited about consumer goods. If Jose talks to me about robotics, I'm not sure. <laughs> Love you, Jose, but I'm not sure I would be excited about it because <laughs> it's just not my thing. I don't get it. But that doesn't mean that Jose makes less of an impact or I make less of an, of an impact. I think it's the cumulative impact that we're all making in your own little ways because I think we're all designed and have different strengths and weaknesses. I love that equation, Minnie. So what you're good at and maybe what you, what insights you have, you know, cause I think you're all coming from a place like you said, you know, if you hadn't worked at the cosmetics company and learned how to scale up the operations of a warehouse, you wouldn't have been valuable. So it's sort of, what are you good at? What do you know? And what are you excited about? And um, I, I, I think that's just really wise advice. I, I would also add is, focus. Don't be afraid to choose. I think yes. we live in a world, technology gives us sort of a distorted view of everything. We see everything at once. We, we call it all at onceness. And it is, it's overwhelming. And I also think the technology world that, that, you know, people that go to Berkeley or go to Stanford, we're all steeped in this world of where the tech giants have, have sprung from. And tech today, from my vantage point, they have sort of a, a everything to everybody mindset. There, there are no barriers to how big and expansive these companies can be. I mean, we, you know, we have a little company called Apple Computer. It's now, you know, in the uh, movie business and the TV business and the podcasting business. And so I think that um, just to build on Minnie's point, I would include, you know, just start somewhere that's meaningful to you. What about you, Jose? What do you think? 
I, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with many and, and there's a, there's a process of introspection that needs to happen. Um, anything you choose to work on is going to be a lot, nothing is going to be get done in a, you know, in a month, in, in even in a year, this is something that you're committing multiple years. It's a journey. It's going to have ups and downs. Sometimes it's going to feel awful. Sometimes it's going to feel like the purpose of your life. So I would say there needs to be a process of introspection where you say, I will be happy to commit myself to this as my mission over the next couple of years, regardless of how, how it, 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 it pans out. So you, you just need to be honest with yourself um, and dive, um, dive head first. Introspection and reflection, I would say, are kind of the same thing, right, Jose? Yeah, thanks. Jordan, what else do you Thank got? you. Yeah, we have a few um, directed questions. So Minnie, this is from John. He says, welcome back. I think he's referring to when he came to our food speaker series last fall. Um, he said that the last time you spoke to us, you mentioned Imperfect serves 75% of the population. Has that number increased? And what would it take for Imperfect to get to 99% and above? And if, if that is indeed part of your vision. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, John. Um, and thanks for having me again and not getting tired of listening to me. <laughs> Um, so yes, that 75% number has increased. We launched, we just launched in Denver, which we, where we weren't available in, in for a while. Um, what would it take to get to 99%? And do we even want to get to 99%? I don't know how realistic it is, to be honest, to be like, to cover the entire America, um, and have the scale and efficiencies that we need and be able to deliver fresh and good quality groceries to you. Um, so I'm not sure if 99% or 100% is the ultimate goal, but definitely we want to get to most of the major areas. The one area that I think we still have, that I know we still have a huge gap in is in the Southeast. We're not able to deliver to the Atlanta's and Florida area um, because we just don't have a facility there. That is something that we are very actively considering and thinking about and figuring out the cost benefit of doing that um, because it, it, it obviously, because we're a for-profit company, it has to make sense financially for us as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have one for Jose from our amazing GSI Eva. She asks, can Octo integrate reusable containers? And is there an opportunity for the system to be used to clean reusables as that gains traction in the takeaway market? Um, yes, uh, actually. Um, our system is flexible enough to uh, use any type of container. So right now, um, we use whatever container our partner customer uses. Most of the time, they, they're compostable um, uh, bowls because we're focused on everything to go. But I think that that's something really important because this boom of off-premise means that there is so much waste when it comes to packaging. Everything is, is wrapped in plastic um, and packaged to go and has utensils and comes in a bag. So there's a pretty huge opportunity there for sure, Eva. Um, and it's more for us to ideally push that on our customers a little bit, but it's something that we're definitely talking about. Great. Maria, I'll give uh, one for you. Um, I think the experience of taking uh, a high growth venture back company public is one of the kind of paramount experiences for a CFO. And, you know, on this journey, you're always trying to validate and prove and demonstrate the long-term viability of the, um, of the business model, of the customer need. Um, how are you thinking about that now? How are you preparing the company? How are you preparing yourself and, um, you know, for the eventualities of someday being a public company? was in mute. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, with the very hot IPO market <laughs> that we're uh, potentially just coming off of, um, I'm sure that every company that is at our stage is having the conversations in the boardroom. And 
Uh, you mentioned Amal, uh, and Amal has a very big vision for FBN. I mean, he, his vision is to have FBN be one of the largest agriculture companies in the world, or right? Ag Tech, but be one of the largest agricultural companies in the world one day. Uh, and so we are in it for the very long run, um, and we could be public now. I mean, we're, our financials and our backing is that we could do it. Uh, but we want it to be a, you know, a successful, uh, very successful, we want to be a success, not just go IPO, we want to be a successful public company. Um, and so we decided to you know, take our time. We had decided a year ago that we were going to wait a, a little bit longer and we resisted the temptation to go when the market was hot. Um, because we, we think that, uh, you know, waiting a, a little bit longer for us was, was the right thing to do. I mean, clearly it's conversations we're having, um, but uh, Amal was always very clear that we were never try, going to try and time the market, that we were going to be ready. Um, and when we're ready, we were going to go. Uh, and so that's really the, the path that we've taken. It's been the right path. Uh, didn't fall for the SPAC mania that's uh, been happening as well. So yeah. definitely. That's very uh, refreshing. You know, I think I, as an entrepreneur in food, I always have a little adage that it takes 15 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> and I think building things to last in food is an important signal to the public markets and to entrepreneurs that it's, it's hard, um, but to create lasting value in the world, it takes time, it takes persistence, and it takes patience. So what a great um, conversation tonight. There's still a few other questions that we're going to send off to you individually, and we'll try to maybe get them answered and funneled back to the students. We, we never have enough time um, to do it all, but I just would love to thank uh, Minnie and Maria and Jose. I'd love it if everybody could come off mute for a minute and just thank them so we can hear your voices and your breath. Let's say Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't you love that? Yes. Thank that worked. That. Um, Thanks, Will. Um, Eva, could you take us out and give us a couple of um, brief instructions about what's ahead and how to make a great final class next week? You're on mute. There you go. Muted. Here we go. So just a another reminder, as Will mentioned, final paper is due May 12th. And Will and I have really enjoyed speaking with some of you in our office hours and invite all of you to reach out if you want to chat through your outline, talk about brainstorming. Um, this is really the opportunity for you to map out that personal plan for making change in the food system. So please uh, get started on that if you have not yet gotten your outline going. And again, we would love the opportunity to chat through that with you. And we thought that this would be a nice opportunity to invite you all to share in the chat, what is the topic, the focus of your final paper? And this could be a chance to potentially connect with classmates who are focused on similar themes and I think Minnie's feedback here really resonates again. You know, what are, what are you looking to achieve in terms of what are you passionate about? What is something that's meaningful for you? Where do you have some insights that you can share? So hopefully this will create some opportunity for connection. If you put your uh, answer in the chat now, we will save the chat and we will share it um, so you can actually, maybe we'll figure out how to put it into a spreadsheet so people can see what other people in the class are working on and maybe team up quickly, so. Absolutely, I'll create a Google Doc for the class. And how about the, what's happening next week? What's happening next week, Will? Quest wow, Love is really? Quest yeah. Love, the <laughs> one and only? Did you know that Quest Love is actually the music director for the Academy Awards on Sunday night? And we're hoping he can fly back in time to New York to, um, to be with us at class. No, he's going to be there. But, you know, I am so excited because this is one of the most creative human beings on the planet right now. And he is, um, you know, my mom taught me a word when I was a kid called ubiquitous. He is ubiquitous, but he's also just an inspiring, touching human being. 
And I love this quote that I found today. Art is about opening up to possibility. Possibility links to hope. We all need hope. Artists like Questlove are the social entrepreneurs of the day, really. They're the, they're the signalers of what's to come. So I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to have Questlove as our guest next week. Please be on time. We're gonna start right on time because he's in New York and we can't keep him up too late and we wanna get every minute we can with him. So we'll see you next Wednesday at 6, 10 sharp. Please be there.